Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. In search for strategies to curb pandemics, scientists strive to understand how pathogens slip past the immune system and wreak havoc on the body. To achieve this goal, researchers study viral infection in models that mimic how different cell types interact with each other, the immune system, or the environment. Organ on a chip models combine tissue engineering with microfluidics to replicate an organ's biological and biomechanical context. Lung chips have proven instrumental for studying viral evolution, identifying drug-resistant variants, and screening for new drugs that could prevent these variants from initiating the next pandemic. In this episode, Nayla Halterman from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Don Ingber, the cell biologist who invented organ on a chip technology and the founding director of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University, to learn more. As a virus enters the body and infects a cell, it triggers a cascade of host responses that it must overcome to produce a life-threatening infection. To understand how respiratory viruses such as influenza virus and SARS-CoV-2 infect lung cells, and to identify therapeutic molecules that could prevent disease, scientists typically add the virus to a cell culture dish and screen for molecules that prevent viral infection or replication. However, Drugs that are discovered with this method often fail to protect people from disease in follow-up clinical studies. This is because cells that grow in a dish face a very different environment than those within an organ such as the human lung. When Don Ingber saw how traditional culturing conditions change the morphology and behavior of lung cells, he set out to develop methods and instruments that more accurately reflect our organs' physiological environments. To do this, he took an unconventional approach and adapted technologies used in the microchip industry so that they could support cell growth. I got into the world of bridging the gap between microchip manufacturing and biology by um, collaborating with investigators like George Whitesides at Harvard, who was developing new ways to make microchips inexpensively and adapting a technique he had developed to make culture substrates for cells where we could control their shape and then control function. That technology started to be used to miniaturize instrumentation by making what are called microfluidic devices, where you can have control over features at the same scale that cells and tissues live at, micrometer, nanometer scale. You can make channels that fluids go through, and they would have branches, like little tributaries that come into a main river, if you like, but all less than a millimeter wide. And these look like small blood vessels, all right? And so we combined all of this into what was our first organ on a chip device. Part of that was triggered by one of the past trainees between George Whitesides and myself, a scientist named Shu Takayama. I was at a meeting, and he had made one of these microfluidic devices the size of small lung airways, and he put a droplet of fluid, like a mucus drop through it, and it made a noise. This little inner chip made a noise that was exactly the noise that I was taught to listen for through a stethoscope when I went to medical school, which indicated fluid on the lungs. And I love this because in medical school, we'd all ask the professor, like, what makes that noise? And they say, I don't know, it's probably fluid on the lungs. Well, this showed it was like little droplets, you know, moving through the particular size channel. The student who did that work, Dan Hunt, applied to my lab to do a postdoc. And I said, why don't we try to build a real living three-dimensional breathing lung on a chip? And that was the beginning of the lung on a chip story. As we breathe in, air flows into the smallest units of the lung, the air sacs. Here, a single layer of lung cells interacts with one row of blood vessel cells to extract oxygen from the air and transfer it into the bloodstream. To recreate this organ structure on a microchip, Ingber and his team tried many different materials and configurations. The lung on a chip they engineered is made of transparent, flexible rubber and is about the size of a USB stick. 
It contains two superimposed microchannels that are separated by a thin porous membrane, which allows cells that grow on either side to interact with each other. The scientists coated this membrane with extracellular matrix, a gel-like substance that provides structural support to cells as they grow and helps anchor them to the membrane. They next grew lung cells in the top channel and streamed air through it, while they cultured blood vessel cells in the bottom channel and perfused it with medium that takes the place of blood. This lung on a chip contained the major cellular elements of air sacs, but one critical component was missing, the physical consequences of breathing. The air-liquid interface is critical in lung to get those cells to be fully functional. But the breathing motions, particularly in the air sac, is well known clinically, is absolutely critical for production of gene expression, uh, development, surfactant, which allows the lung to open and close. I think that was one of the big leaps in our chips over other approaches. Is we really try to get the mechanical environment right. The trick is that our chip has side chambers that are hollow where we can apply cyclic suction. And that literally pulls the side walls and this intervening membrane with tissues attached so that it stretches and relaxes to the same rate and degree as when we breathe. One of the amazing things about organ chips is that we take cells and almost always use the same medium they were cultured in for years. And now we give them the right physical environment, fluid flow, breathing-like motions in the lung, and they differentiate and exhibit specialized functions and levels never seen before. Cells that grew flat on a dish, same medium. When Ingber realized that his team had created an in vitro model that mimics the lung's physiology, the opportunities to study the organ's response to various toxins and pathogens seemed endless. The scientists first characterized the effects of smog particulates on healthy lung chips, and later did the same with cigarette smoke. To do this, they created a cigarette smoking robot that simulates human inhalation patterns. When Ingber and his team connected this robot to their lung chip's airspace, they analyzed the lung cell's responses to smoke and found similar gene expression changes as those found in the lungs of patients who smoke cigarettes. Having confirmed that his lung chips accurately model the tissue's response to toxins, Ingber next wondered if he could also use them to study how respiratory viruses infect the organ. Because the immune system is an important player in this process, Ingber added white blood cells to the medium that perfuses the organ chip's vascular channel. He then infected these lung chips with bacteria or viruses and measured levels of cytokines, the inflammatory molecules that are part of the systemic immune responses triggered by various pathogens, including SARS-CoV-2. Not only did the infected lung tissue recruit the immune cells through the blood vessel cell layer to the site of infection, but they also recapitulated inflammatory cytokine expression patterns as they occur in the body. Because we had these organ chip technology, I was funded by both NIH and DARPA about four years ago to develop a model for potential pandemic respiratory viruses. We're all worried about influenza based on 100 years ago. So we developed a model of influenza infection on the chip. The question was, could you see emergence of viral variants of concern that become resistance to drug therapy. So we infected our chips while treated with drugs at, at a dose that's 90% effective, so 10% could survive. We would then put a little droplet of, of medium through the airspace and then pass it to an airspace of another chip treated the same way as if it were like coughing a droplet of mucus. And then we'd treat them for days and then we would do it to another chip and then another chip. And we would keep testing the viruses that come out of those chips to see did resistance develop. And with one drug that was used for years clinically, in eight passages, we got resistant viruses. And we did genome sequencing, which identified three mutations that are the same exact mutations that have been seen in human patients in clinical studies who became resistant to this drug, which was validating. But we also found a couple that no one has ever seen before, which was really exciting because maybe you could use this to predict what's coming down the pipe, both for therapeutics and for vaccines. Ingber and his team repeated this experiment with a second antiviral molecule that is now a commonly used drug in the clinic, 
and found that influenza virus could also develop resistance against this treatment. With these results, Ingber was ready to gear up and infect his lung chips with a newly evolved viral variant to screen for therapeutic candidates that could help combat future flu pandemics. But an unexpected turn of events led the team to use the lung-on-a-chip model for a different respiratory virus, SARS-CoV-2. When it became clear how rapidly this coronavirus could overload the world's health systems, Ingber and his team shifted gears and used their lung chips to study how SARS-CoV-2 attacks patient lung tissues and how they could stop the virus in its tracks. I have two postdocs virologists who are from China. They were following this on social media. They engineered a pseudotype virus that expresses the CoV-2 spike protein. A pseudotype virus means it will will enter cells, but it, it won't cause infection. Long story short, they quickly tested drugs that have previously shown some activity against related SARS viruses, the original SARS, MERS, and things like that. And remember, this is like January, February of 2020. So This was sort of desperation. So the first thing they did is what they did in their old virology lab. They just tested it against the cell line that they know viruses grow well. They tested 30 drugs. Eight showed good activity, of which two were hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. It was like, whoa. But then we tested them in our airway chip, and we tested them under flow, giving them at a dose in the blood that would be similar to what's seen in humans. And with that, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine had no effect which eventually is confirmed in animals. We found one drug that was related to them, another anti-malarial that showed activity. And we we tested it with a collaborator with Ben Tenover at at Mount Sinai in a hamster model of COVID-19. And and it had significant inhibition there as well. So that is now in clinical trials in 13 sites across Africa, because it's already used in Africa for 50 years as an anti-malarial prophylaxis. So that was exciting an example of how these sorts of things can help rapidly advance drug development. Ingber's team has now developed organ chips for nearly every organ in the body. They recently created a body on a chip by linking 10 chips that each model a different organ and flowing blood-like medium from one chip's vascular channel to the next. The body on a chip allows the researchers to study how therapeutic molecules travel through the body, which tissues absorb them, and how various organs metabolize the drugs. These analyses result in accurate pharmacokinetic profiles that can predict how a drug will behave in the body and inform scientists when they develop dosing schemes to maintain a steady concentration in the blood without causing toxic effects. In addition, Ingber now builds his chips with cells obtained from patients with genetic disorders to develop more accurate models for these diseases. It is Ingber's hope that organ-on-a-chip technology will one day replace animal models for drug discovery and toxicity tests. I think they will replace them one animal model at a time. You're going to have to do extensive validation to confirm that you have the robustness and the reliability and that you're as good or better than an animal model. But I've been funded by the FDA for this work for 10 years. They've always said that if you can show that you're as good as an animal model or better, and equally robust and reliable, and it's human, that's exactly what we're looking for, right? And so we have a paper that's in review where we, we're beginning to get some really exciting results that suggest that these chips, particularly liver chips, are better than animal models for predicting toxicity induced by drugs, which is important because every drug has to go through animal testing, usually in rats and dogs, and they're very poor predictors. So that could save billions to the pharma industry, get more effective drugs into patients quicker. That's an exciting possibility. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services Team for The Scientist and narrated by Nayla Halterman. Please join us next month as we learn about the challenges of single-cell RNA deep sequencing. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.